What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there is a ton of news to go over. I apologize in advance for how long this update will be, but uh, there's always timestamps in the description, so please use those if you wanna skip ahead uh, to cut out some of the stuff you're not interested in. You can totally go through that or just break this video up into a few sessions. But I know many of you say the longer the better, so here you go. First thing, of course, it's the LA Auto Show this week, so there's a ton of new vehicle debuts. I'm gonna try and get through them as quickly as I can here. Uh, first off, Porsche revealed the all-new 2020 911 in Carrera S and Carrera 4S trims. And personally, I think this is my favorite vehicle of the show. It just looks fantastic. Uh, I've always liked 911 styling, but I've never had it wow me like this one does. It just, I was really blown away, especially by the interior. Um, but also the back end just looks so good and also the front. But anyway, first let's talk about the performance upgrades here on the 911. The S and the 4S use an upgraded version of the 3 liter twin twin turbo flat six engine from the 991.2, you know, the current version. And so now it does 23 more horsepower and 22 more pound feet of torque for totals of 443 horsepower and 390 pound feet of torque. And uh, with the PDK, it, the Carrera S does zero to 60 in three and a half seconds. Um, and the 4S is only 3.4 seconds. But if you get the Sport Chrono package, it gets even faster with a 0 to 60 of 3.3 seconds for the S, and the 4S is now only 3.2 seconds, which is crazy. The S has a top speed of 191, the 4S is one less at 190. Speaking of that PDK though, um, you know, that's gonna be the only transmission offered here at the very beginning, but they did say um, it's gonna be an eight speed automatic instead of a seven speed, so that's a nice improvement. And they did reassure fans that a manual will be coming at a later date, um, but they didn't specify how much later. On the outside, it still looks very much like a 911, but it's all new with all aluminum panels that are now wider than before. Uh, the front fenders are actually uh, 1.77 inches wider combined. Uh, unlike the previous generation, though um, they all get the wide body uh, back end which is awesome so it used to be you know with the 4s and turbos you got that wider back end but on the regular uh, 911s it was a little more narrow not the case now they all get the same wide body which is great um, another cool thing is that uh, there's flat door handles now which is a cool thing that kind of pop out electronically there and really kind of cleans up the sides nicely the interior is really cool though and harkens back to older 911s here with a more horizontal dash orientation with that huge uh, Porsche Connect infotainment display that's 10.9 inches and nice and wide. And there's also two seven inch displays uh, on uh, the gauges there on both sides uh, that flank an analog uh, tachometer, which looks really good. I love the retro uh, font there they use for that, you know, analog ta tack. It just really, I love the way that looks. Um, anyway, those other two displays can of course show you all kinds of customized uh, info, whatever you'd like really. Um, the lower controls on top of the transmission tunnel have far less buttons than previous Porsches too, which is nice and refreshing. It's a little less overwhelming. Um, and there's also very nice looking metal switch gear, including that little uh, shifter there. And also uh, there's now a real cup holder finally in the middle in the center there. Uh, there's still gonna be one of the dash mounted things on the passenger side um, for the passenger's cup holder. Um, but uh, nice to have one real cup holder there since it used to not be a great cup holder solution before. Another cool feature is there's a new wet mode that can detect moisture and adjust uh, the ABS and stability control systems to better adapt to those conditions automatically. And in the U.S., dealerships uh, will be getting these summer of 2019 uh, with a starting price of $114,250 for the S and the 4S is going to be $121,660, um, which is getting pricey. Now, you know, obviously there will be a base career model and that will be cheaper, um, but it still is just getting pricey. I remember when you can get a new 911 for 70 to 80 grand just like 10 years ago and it just skyrocketed um, and even like I configured one you can go on the Porsche configurator and check one out and uh, the way I configured it it'd be $159,000 which is really pricey for a non turbo trim 911 that's just that's a lot um, but it's it's, a, it's very very nice uh, but steep for sure uh, but anyway cool to see that the next vehicles debuted here is Mazda revealed the all-new 2019 Mazda 3 and uh, so it has sharper 
looks here, similar to other new Mazdas up front there, especially. Out back, it gets these new dual ring tail lamps that I think look really good, both on the hatch, but especially even on the sedan. I think the sedan, in my opinion, is the better looking of the two, uh, this go around. Um, the wheelbase is one inch longer, um, and for that hatch, the height of the vehicle is one inch shorter. Um, for the sedan, it's 0.7 inches lower, uh, but the hatchback length is actually the same overall uh, compared to the previous gen version, the same length, but the sedan is actually 3.2 inches longer, so a little bit more flowing, less stubby than the uh, previous Mazda 3 sedan. They all have the same width, um, and that's unchanged uh, from before. Mechanically, there's a few big upgrades. First, all-wheel drive is now going to be available, although they didn't say what trims um, it's going to be on or what engines it'll be available with. Um, but next is the new engine. So, you know, Mazda has been talking about, uh, you know, this Skyactiv X engine. But, of course, there will still be uh, the 2 liter and 2.5 liter gas engines. And they're also talking about a 1.5 liter and a diesel, which is a 1.8. But I, don't, I think that's just a global thing they're just announcing because we don't get those engines here in the States, and I doubt we will start to get them. Um, but who knows? We'll have to wait and see on that. But anyway, the big news here is that Skyactiv X engine, which has its pioneering spark controlled compression ignition system that gives you that diesel like uh, efficiency while having a, a still a gas engine. Um, and no numbers have been given still as far as horsepower or MPG or anything like that. Um, but it does combine with a 48 volt mild hybrid setup that Mazda calls M Hybrid. And um, so that should give it very, very impressive numbers, hopefully, and uh, maybe be the sportiest version too. We'll have to wait and see. Um, both a six-speed manual and a six-speed automatic will uh, still be available, which is great. Um, the only downside here is that Mazda did say that they swapped out the the, um, the independent rear suspension for a torsion beam rear suspension instead, which um, usually hurts handling a little bit, but it's cheaper. Um, we'll have to see. You know, Obviously, I'll be reviewing one eventually and let you guys know how it handles compared to the old Mazda 3s here, uh, but that's the only thing that's kind of a, a little bit of a step backwards in my opinion. Otherwise, though, on the inside it's uh, more minimalistic with a flatter instrument cluster it has a wider and larger 8.8 .8 inch touchscreen infotainment display but also has that new controller you can see um, which is an updated version of the current one there's also a thinner a pillar for better visibility they say and anyway they said these should be available early next year but uh, Jalopnik uh, was I guess trying to talk to Mazda about the potential of a Mazda speed version and they did confirm that the 2.5 turbo motor does fit in this new Mazda 3 but they also said don't expect a Mazda the speed version because they were said they actually said in the past that, that was a little childish to even offer and they're trying to be more upscale and mature these days and so Mazda speed is a little too kitty for them these days which is kind of a bummer but I mean they're still giving great performing stuff with the you know two and a half liter turbo motor and the CX-5 now and the Mazda 6 um, so maybe they could just offer this as a signature thing and throw the two and a half liter in that uh, the turbo version in the Mazda 3 at some point down the road we'll have to wait and see um, but anyway don't expect any hot hatch version or anything like that because it sounds like they have no plans to go in that direction but anyway cool to see that jeep has revealed the 2020 gladiator truck which is essentially a wrangler pickup truck it has the same hard top and soft top options as the wrangler the same fold down windshield removable doors v6 engine manual automatic transmissions and much of the same looks as well obviously although you know like the grill is slightly tweaked they say it's a little bit larger to help with uh, better cooling whenever you're towing uh, and a few other small little things uh, there is a lot that is different though it's on an all new frame that's not shared with the Wrangler at all and it's a full 31 inches longer than the frame on the Wrangler Unlimited the wheelbase is also 19.4 inches longer than the Wrangler Unlimited it still uses solid Dana 44 axles both in the front and in the back um, with two available track widths and a real rear coil suspension is unique five link setup too they said for the Gladiator here and in 2020 Jeep will be offering a three liter turbo diesel v6 uh, that'll do 260 horsepower and 442 pound-feet of torque for those who want even more capability with that large torque figure there which is best in class by the way um, they all get a selectable four-wheel drive system um, and with the gas v6 they're saying it's already going to tow 7,650 pounds which is best in class as well uh, max payload is on par with the class at about 1600 pounds uh, the bed is five feet long so very very usable uh, trim wise it gets many of the same trims as the Wrangler with Rubicon for off-road enthusiasts
enthusiasts, and there's an overland for more luxurious buyers. Um, and it appears to be only offered in four doors for now. I don't know if there'll be a two-door version later on or what, but uh, they didn't announce any pricing yet for these Gladiators. They just said they'll be in dealers by the second quarter of 2019. Lincoln revealed the 2020 Aviator in LA here, and it looks really good to me. It's almost identical to the concept that was shown at the New York Auto Show uh, back in March, and uh, that's great. Whenever they keep it looking like a concept, that's amazing. Uh, it's going to be pretty powerful, too. It's kind of a hot rod here. It's got two different amounts of power you can choose from. So first, they both start with a 3-liter uh, twin-turbo V6 engine. Um, the base one is 400 horsepower and 400 pound-feet of torque already. Uh, but then there's a plug-in hybrid version, which is actually the faster of the two. That gets you an extra 50 horsepower and an extra 200 pound-feet of torque. Um, so that gives you grand totals of 450 horsepower and 600 pound-feet of torque, uh, which is actually bonkers, to be perfectly honest. That's way above any torque figures you get in anything in, in this class. Um, the PHV version will also be able to run in full EV mode, uh, but Lincoln didn't give any kind of specifics as far as the battery or range or anything like that. They did say it's a modular system, though, which means it'll probably be incorporated in other future vehicles on this platform. First off, the Explorer, um, which I'll mention in a second here, and possibly even the next-gen Mustang, which is supposedly going to be on the same platform with capabilities for rear-wheel drive and all-wheel drive. And uh, they were they already announced a hybrid Mustang, so you know chances of uh, this coming are are likely, and it could use very similar specs for the Mustang as well, which would be interesting. Uh, wouldn't kill off the V8; they'd still have the V8, but this could be you know a third engine, a return for the V6. Um, but have you know that torque would definitely smoke the V8 version. Um, by the way, getting back to the aviators here, they all use the 10-speed auto from Ford, um, and you get either rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive, uh, which is awesome. They offer rear-wheel drive in the Aviator too. Um, it also has a new air glide adaptive air suspension that scans the road to adjust itself for upcoming bumps. It also, with that suspension, can lower itself when it's parked so it looks better. It also can lower itself even further to help when getting in and out of it. And it also stays lower on the highway for better fuel economy, which makes a lot of sense. And it can e even uh, raise itself up, of course, whenever you're on snow or any kind of more challenging terrain. And, uh, and one other cool thing is it has NFC capability, which allows your phone to be the key. And it'll pair itself up so you don't actually need a key you just use your phone which is cool um, the interior is very similar to the navigator which is an excellent thing the navigator interior is one of the most impressive interiors in an suv that I think I've ever seen. And so copying it here for the Aviator is a great idea, honestly. Don't mess with perfection. Um, and so anyway, there's no price that's been given yet, uh, but the, they're saying it's going to be on sale summer of 2019. So cool to see that. Also, I want to briefly mention uh, two vehicles that were spied this past week, very briefly. Um, but we mentioned the new Explorer coming. It's going to be on the same platform as this Aviator. Um, it was spied testing here with very little camouflage uh, running around Detroit here. Um, it's most likely going to be shown in its production trim in Detroit in January at the auto show there. Um, and uh, so it could share a lot of the same mechanical components as the Aviator. Of course, it's going to be completely different exterior and interior wise. Um, but Ford also, by the way, uh, briefly put out a teaser for the GT500 and also confirmed that will be uh, shown at Detroit finally. Um, so that's great news. The other vehicle that was spied was Honda was spied testing the production version of the Urban EV, which is the cute little boxy retro thing they showed uh, back in 2017. Um, and thankfully, it looks like it's keeping those concept car looks for the most part with the same boxy um, design and round LED headlamps there. It looked very retro, but it now is a four-door vehicle instead of two, or at least that's the one that was spied. There could still be a two-door version. Um, we just haven't seen it yet, but uh, the four doors make sense that you're going to be able to sell it, obviously, to a larger crowd. Um, and uh, anyway, it also has camera side mirrors, which is very cool. Uh, I think it's a first for Honda. Um, as of right now, the rumors are saying it'll be shown at the Geneva Motor Show this coming March. March, um, and could be on sale by the end of next year, they're saying. Um, but supposedly this isn't coming to the States. I'm not sure why. Um, I guess they're designing it for Europe and um, you know Asian markets, but I feel like it'd be a no-brainer, obviously, to bring it here. It would be a really cool first uh, full EV, you know, outside of the other stuff that Honda's done, you know, but something totally different and new. Um, so fingers crossed that we do get it because that would be pretty cool. Uh, a Honda that we'll, we will actually be uh, getting here pretty soon was revealed in LA was is the return of the Honda Passport for the 2019 model year here. So this time you can see it's heavily based on the Pilot. Uh, it's just shorter and sportier. So it does have some nice unique touches here though, like there's a floating roof design in the back um, and 
you obviously you have the more aggressive body cladding on it. Uh, but it uses the same three and a half liter V6 as the Pilot with 280 horsepower, 262 pound feet of torque, and a nine speed uh, automatic transmission. Front wheel drive is standard, but you can get all wheel drive as an option. And the all wheel drive system is the same as it is on the Pilot and the Ridgeline. So it's a, you know like a torque vectoring system. And they also say with the all wheel drive, it'll tow 5,000 pounds still. It's also lifted an inch higher than the Pilot, so that gives it a little bit more of a sportier look as well. But it is six inches shorter overall, roughly in length. Um, obviously in the back, it's just the hatch is like half as long as it normally is on a Pilot. Um, but even still, uh, Honda says it has, it has the most passenger space for its class of, you know, just a two row SUV of this size. Otherwise, the interior looks basically identical to the Pilot and Ridgeline, um, but the largely digital gauges there are very cool, and it's a new thing that I, at least I haven't seen yet. And anyway, these are going to be on sale early next year, but they didn't give any pricing yet for that either. Land Rover has revealed the all new 2020 Range Rover uh, Evoque, and as you can see, it's got new styling that's heavily influenced by the Velar, but otherwise, they kind of kept the same packaging as the current Evoque. Now, this is on an all new platform, so it's not just a refresh, it is an entirely new model. And so, getting into some of the changes now, you can get, still get a regular two liter turbo four cylinder with 246 horsepower. But the new thing here is a 48 volt mount hybrid setup, um, which gives you a combined output of 296 horsepower. Uh, they either the either engine uh, gets uh, the ZF nine speed automatic, regardless of you know whether you go for the hybrid or not. Um, but uh, the platform is new to, in order to fit that 48 volt system, um, and that makes the wheelbase slightly longer. Uh, so they said that it kind of stretched it out a little bit. It's small small changes, but they did stretch it out a little bit so that now actually has an inch more legroom for rear passengers slightly more cargo space as well in the storage space areas um, all-wheel drive is standard and it disconnects the rear wheels when they're not needed for better uh, you know fuel economy uh, it also uses the uh, terrain response 2 system to detect what type of terrain it's on and adjust itself you know accordingly other tech uh, it's the first use of Land Rover's smart settings which uh, uses AI to learn what the driver likes and frequently does you know the radio stations you often listen to all that type of stuff and will give you intelligent suggestions and make sure everything is dialed in exactly the way you want it to be, which is kind of cool, at least in theory. We'll see how it works in reality. It also, uh, they also, this is their first debut of their camera rearview mirror, which is a huge help for the Evoque because they have a tiny little rear window. I reviewed an Evoque a long time ago and visibility out of the back wasn't great. So that helps a lot by, you know, obviously not having to worry about that. You just have the camera instead. Um, there's also uh, what they're calling a ground view camera that shows you what's in front of and even slightly underneath the front of the vehicle there, which is kind of cool. I'm not sure exactly how they do that, but very, uh, very cool stuff there. Um, and so anyway, these are going to be debuting actually in the States at the Sh Chicago Auto Show uh, in, uh, I think, February usually. And that's when we'll hopefully we'll get some more pricing and availability details. Uh, so a little bit of a longer wait for that, but anyway, cool to see that. And Mercedes has shown the new AMG GTR Pro in LA. Um, it's just even more aggressive than the AMG GTR, so it gets a more track-oriented suspension um, that actually has a coilover setup, just like a mechanically adjustable. You can sit there and tweak your coilovers. Um, so obviously very track oriented. The uh, power is also a little bit improved. So now it's 577 horsepower, 516 pound feet of torque from that four liter twin turbo V8. It'll now do zero to 60 in three and a half seconds, top speed of 198. It also gets more aggressive arrow in the front there you can see and, um, and even in the rear as well. It even has a carbon fiber roof that has a little bit of a lower portion in the middle there uh, to again just help with all that aerodynamic efficiency and uh, just helping to give it better lap times which they didn't specify exactly how much faster this is exactly but did say obviously it's going to be faster around the Nurburgring ring and all that kind of stuff um, it also gets these unique graphics uh, you can see as a package it's an option you don't have to get the graphics if you don't want but that would separate it from a regular GTR um, other things here you can see it's got these more angry uh, headlights and tail lamps that they also uh, rolled out on all the Mercedes Mercedes AMG GT uh, Coupe and Roadsters as well, and they showed those refreshed uh, versions at LA here as well. In addition to the GTR Pro version, um, so for that regular uh, Coupe and Roadster, um, now there's mostly most of the changes are on the inside. So it, it gets a very similar interior to what you saw on the uh, sedan version of the AMG GT that they revealed last, uh, you know, a couple earlier this year, I guess. And anyway, so uh, you can see it's got a new infotainment screen there. It's 10.25 inches. It's 
little bit larger. There's new digital gauges that are 12.3 inches and a new steering wheel that has those new touch control buttons like you see on other Mercedes models. Um, otherwise, same engine, same performance uh, as they've had in the past. Um, but anyway, interesting to see those. Audi has revealed the e-tron GT concept and they say it's just a concept for now but they are saying a version will be entering production late in 2020. Um, the reason for that uh, guarantee is that they're saying that this shares a platform with the Porsche Taycan uh, or Taycan however you pronounce that I still can't get it right. Um, and so that, uh, you know, is they're co-developing the two. So it's going to benefit from a lot of that shared knowledge and tech. So it's going to have 582 horsepower, at least in the concept version here it does, with motors both on the front and rear axles that enable it to do 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds and uh, 0 to 124 in roughly 12 seconds with a top speed of 149. It has over 90 kilowatt hours uh, for the battery pack and uh, roughly 248 miles of range. It also has four wheel steering in addition to of course four wheel drive. They say it can be charged up to 80% in 20 minutes uh, for 199 miles of additional range. Thanks to an 800 volt uh, electrical uh, charge uh, system there. You can also use wireless induction pads, supposedly in theory, that would charge the car gradually overnight. Um, so as far as the, the dimensions and stuff, I think it looks really good. It's as long as an A7, but about seven inches more narrow and two inches lower. Um, and I think it looks great, honestly. It's a little stubby. Uh, you know, I think I can kind of see some of the take on there uh, in its, uh, you know, proportions and stuff. But um, anyway, that's uh, really cool to see. Other quick Audi news to mention briefly is last week I talked about a report in Auto Express uh, that was saying Audi was considering making a TT sedan. Um, that uh, actually has been debunked because Audi's global PR boss told Car Advice this past week they had an idea of a TT family a while back, but not so much anymore is his quote. So uh, TT fans can relax. It sounds like they, they're they focusing on electrified stuff and other things. They can't be bothered with small sedans that don't sell a lot. Um, so that makes sense and cool to hear that. Bentley revealed the convertible version of the Continental GT in LA. And so it has all the same stuff as the coupe, basically, including the engine performance. Uh, but one new thing is there is an option for the roof to be made out of tweed, which is, uh, I think, a first for a vehicle. Uh, regardless of what roof you get, though, they claim it's going to have better sound soundproofing uh, thanks to um, I guess you know they just have thickened things up or whatever but it's got a three decibel reduction in noise supposedly compared to the last convertible there's also a new neck warmer that's warmer and quieter than before along with available heated armrests now which is something I think was only available on the s-class cabriolet before um, and anyway it's also 20% lighter than the previous convertible thanks to this new uh, Continental GT and its lighter underpinnings in general and it's also 5% stiffer um, but they didn't give any pricing or release date on that yet either. Genesis has revealed the redesigned G90 in uh, South Korea actually this week. They didn't show up at the LA Auto Show which is interesting um, but anyway it has lots of Bentley inspirations. Speaking of Bentley it looks great to me though um, and although the wheels you know might be a little controversial to some you know let me know your thoughts about that in the comments below um, but the interior doesn't change as much as the exterior but does look very very nice still. Um, it gets a redesigned user interface there for the infotainment system and there's active noise cancellation uh, now as well. Uh, as far as uh, safety tech it also does now come with lane centering for the adaptive cruise control so a little more advanced um, and there isn't any kind of pricing or official info at all for the American version. This was just I think a South Korean thing for now um, but Autoblog says they expect these to be available by the middle of next year and I'm guessing maybe we'll get some more info at the Detroit Auto Show in January or sometime after that. Um, another expensive Hyundai that actually was shown in LA um, was the all new uh, three row 2020 Hyundai Palisade, which is their new largest crossover here. Um, and even though it looks huge, it's actually considered a mid-sized SUV. So um, it's uh, going to be competing with stuff like the Ford Explorer, the Honda Pilot, and the Subaru Ascent. Um, so it can seat up to eight people. So it is a, a large vehicle for sure. It has an updated 3.8 liter V6 to power it, and it runs uh, the Atkinson cycle. And so that helps with its improved efficiency. 
and so now it does 291 horsepower and 262 pound-feet of torque and it comes thankfully with an eight-speed auto they didn't go to the CVT route like Subaru so that's that's a, an improvement there um, front-wheel drive standard but all-wheel drive is optional of course interior it looks pretty nice here it's got looks like it has lots of metal buttons and trim uh, there's a 10.25 inch widescreen infotainment screen uh, that's controlled by touch as well which is nice to see it also gets uh, some nicer gauges that have a digital portion there in the middle interestingly there's a couple really cool things they've included here so first off it allows you to connect two Bluetooth devices at the same time so if a passenger wants to stream music they can do that without disconnecting the driver's phone which I think is actually brilliant and really handy I'm surprised no one else has offered this yet uh, another family friendly thing is there's an in-car intercom system which is similar to the what Honda debuted in the new Odyssey where you can kind of have a PA system and talk to people in the third row since apparently I guess that's a hard thing to do <laughs> I don't have any experience with that but that seems kind of bizarre but I guess people seem to like that there's also a rear sleep mode um, that actually allows um, the driver and front passenger to listen to music and turns off the second and third row speakers so you're less likely to um, you know wake up anyone who might be sleeping back there which um, especially if you have babies or something I think as a, another very brilliant inclusion that uh, I'm sure many others will copy quickly. Um, there's also second row uh, ventilated seats as an option, which is again something that really isn't usually offered outside of you know full size luxury sedans and you know high end ones at that. Um, and there's also uh, you know just a bunch of other stuff that's uh, family friendly, such as seven USB ports and 16 cup holders. Um, and so anyway, there isn't any pricing yet for these, but they'll be in U.S. dealers by next summer. Kia has revealed the all-new Soul for the 2020 model year here, and uh, it stands out a lot. It's got even bolder looks than before, which was tough to do, but they managed to outdo themselves. Um, the front end looks very futuristic with these LED headlights that look like they're full width, but I think they said it's actually just a plastic piece in the middle there that looks like an LED light, but it actually doesn't light up, I don't think. Uh, I could be wrong, but that's just what it looks like to me. Um, the back has these huge taillights that run vertically and even wrap around the sides a little bit there. Um, powertrain options are mostly the same, uh, but two of the three have been improved. So uh, the base engine is a naturally aspirated two liter four cylinder that actually is from the new Forte. So it gets all those same improvements like I mentioned in my Forte review and does now 147 horsepower and 132 pound feet of torque. The Soul Turbo is now called the Soul GT line. Um, and so maybe that gives us some hope to be a full on Soul GT with maybe more horsepower. That'd be cool. Anyway, this GT line uses the same 1.6 liter turbo. Turbo, uh, that you used in the Soul Turbo previously, same 201 horsepower, 195 pound-feet of torque. Both only come with a seven-speed dual-clutch auto, though, which is a little bit of a bummer. It'd be nice if they offered the manual on the GT version there. Um, lastly, though, there's the Soul EV, which is actually now the fastest version of the Soul. It uses an electric motor and a 64 kilowatt-hour battery from the Kona Electric and Nero EV. Um, it gives you 201 horsepower, but 291 pound-feet of torque, so it absolutely crushes the turbo there with that uh, you know torque figure. And so it's way faster than the old 109 horsepower Soul EV they have had in the past and they didn't announce any any range but we know it's 258 miles in the Kona electric so I'm guessing it'll be similar here for the Soul although maybe a slightly less since the uh, it seems like the Soul is a little less aerodynamic but they did uh, block off that grill in the front a little bit more to give it better aerodynamic efficiency that's unique obviously to the EV version it also gets some unique wheels for the EV version the interior gets this new nice widescreen display that actually is uh, pretty cool and I think the first time Kia has used that and there's also some cool interior lighting as well well, which I think actually is a really cool, cool little uh, design to it. And so anyway, gas soles are going to be available in the first half of 2019 um, with the EV version coming sometime in 2020. But again, no pricing has been released yet. Nissan has shown a couple of refreshes here at the auto show. That's about it. Um, first off is the 2019 Maxima refresh. It's got, you know, sharper front and back bumpers here with more aggressive lighting. It's a little bit darker with the, the lighting as well, especially the tail lamps there. There's also new 19 inch wheels and a rear spoiler on the SR trim as well. The interior seems to get some nicer finishes as well. Uh, you know, it's always they've always done a nice job with quilting and, you know, things looking nice at least. Uh, Nissan Safety Shield 360 driver assistance tech is also now available, but on the Maxima, it's only in the SR Premium and the Platinum trims, um, where it's, it's standard in the Platinum, it's optional in the SR Premium. 
But that's kind of a bummer considering other car companies have already made that stuff standard. Like Honda has its standard. Toyota has its standard on all their stuff. Um, so for this to only be reserved for the top trims, uh, it seems a little strange. Nissan did say, though, that they want to make it standard on 1 million vehicles by 2021. I'm not sure how they're counting that 1 million vehicles, but... They say that's their goal, so I'm guessing they're going to eventually make this stuff more standard across the board. Mechanically, though, it's the same uh, 300 horsepower V6 and a CVT. Uh, it'll be on sale mid-December, which is uh, cool to see. Uh, also, they revealed the refreshed 2019 Murano in LA, and it's got similar updates to the front and the back, um, you know, more aggression and uh, darker lamps and stuff like that. It'll also be available in three new colors, including Mocha Almond Pearl, Deep Blue Pearl, and Sunset Drift Chroma Flare, which is quite, sounds quite interesting. Mechanically, it's got the same stuff again as well, 260 horsepower V6 for the Murano. Inside, it gets some nicer materials again, and all the trim levels get standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with a new 8-inch uh, touchscreen, which is cool. The Safety Shield 360 tech is also uh, only available on the top two trims again, uh, standard on the Platinum, optional on what the, the second one up, the SL Technology Package. Um, um, and that's the only way you can get that safety tech is in those top two trims. It's going to be on sale mid-December as well. And uh, also Nissan did announce um, that both them and Infiniti will be showing next-gen EV concepts in Detroit in January. So we'll have to keep an eye out for those. And some other electrified news here. Toyota had a couple of debuts. Um, in addition to the TRD trims, I talked about those last week. Um, but the other stuff that's new here is they revealed the 2020 Corolla Hybrid. And so they also revealed the all-wheel drive Prius, which I'll get to in a second. But first off, the Corolla Hybrid. It uses the newest version of this Toyota Hybrid Synergy Drive from the Prius. Uh, but this instead uses a nickel metal hydride battery under the back seat instead of the lithium ion one you usually get in a Prius. Um, and uh, Toyota says that it keeps the trunk space the same um, with even though you have that nickel metal hydride battery um, and it pairs it with a 1.8 liter four cylinder and a CVT. Uh, it'll have an EV mode but they didn't specify a range yet. Um, the hybrids also get unique 15 inch wheels which are pretty small but I guess it's for those uh, low rolling resistance tires and um, otherwise it shares everything else with the other new Corollas for 2020 you know so same nice interior and you know more space and all that kind of stuff and even like the safety sense 2.0 which like I mentioned toy to make standard that driver assistance tech no EPA ratings have been shared yet either release date or pricing is all to be determined um, anyway interesting to see that and then they also showed the 2019 Prius all-wheel drive e which is what they're calling it so this also debuts a refresh for the regular Prius uh, which gets a slightly more subdued look which is appreciated in the front and in the back there um, and I think it looks a little bit better although now in my eyes it has a mustache there in the grill in the front which I uh, it just is a little comical looking, uh, but I think it's an improvement over the uh, current Prius look, so I'm not going to try and nitpick. Anyway, the all-wheel drive version uh, has the same engine and transmission as the regular Prius. Um, it just adds an electric motor to power the back wheels, so it's completely independent of the front. So it's almost like something they just kind of bolted up and, you know, obviously incorporated it into it. Um, but it's a, you know, a little bit of a different all-wheel drive setup than a traditional setup would be. So it kicks in uh, those that rear electric motor from zero to six miles per hour and then can continue to be engaged as it's needed up to 43 miles per hour. After that, it dis disengages, which means on the highway, you're still stuck with front wheel drive. Um, so, you know, it only gives you that stability for a little while. But once you're up to those types of speeds, you usually usually don't need the extra, you know, uh, two wheels. So it should work pretty well uh, and at least help get you started, which is the toughest part in snow and stuff like that. Um, and uh, otherwise, it's uh, only slightly less efficient than a regular Prius with EPA ratings already shared here of 52 in the city, 48 on the highway, and 50 combined, which is only two worse than uh, the regular Prius for each rating um, in all the regular trims of the Prius aside from the Thrifty L Eco version, which is several MPG higher than a regular Prius. It also, another difference between the regular Prius and this is it uses the nickel hydride battery instead of the lithium ion one. Um, and they said that's primarily because the nickel battery does better better in low temperatures and they're assuming if you're buying an all-wheel drive Prius you're driving it in the snow and so you're going to want that better cold weather performance so that's why they swapped it out um, and they said it sits under the rear seat and doesn't affect trunk space or change anything in cargo wise um, but anyway cool to see they're offering that.
And this EV startup company called Rivion has debuted their R1 truck and R1S SUV at the LA Auto Show. And they're fully electric and they sound quite promising, uh, but I'm not going to go too in depth on them just because there seems to be a new EV company popping up every week, it seems, and making bold claims and all kinds of huge promises and wowing everyone with all this cool stuff. And none of them have come to market yet. Now, hopefully, this one does. I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but I'm just going to be a little briefer because of that. So it's, it has a huge 180 kilowatt hour battery pack for over 400 miles of range and four motors, one on each axle here, um, for a total of 800 horsepower, um, which is enough for it to do a three second zero to 60 time, which means it'll keep up with all of the fastest hypercars in a pickup truck body, which is just bizarrely insane and awesome. You know, if they can deliver, that would be amazing. It'll also tow 11,000 pounds. Um, the interior is very nice and futuristic too, while still being durable. They say you can wash stuff out very easily and all that. Um, it also has lots of storage since there's no engine. So you have a large front trunk in addition to obviously having uh, the large truck truck bed. Then you also get a pass-through tunnel there uh, behind the rear seats. So all kinds of cool spots. They said you could fit like snowboards there behind the rear seats in that tunnel thing. And uh, obviously it's nice to actually have a real trunk as well as the truck bed. I feel a lot of truck owners, you know, might miss having a trunk that's closed off from the elements. So with this, you get the best of both worlds, which is actually very brilliant. And again, would make a lot of sense. They also claim it's going to have level three autonomy, which means it's going to be totally hands-free in most circumstances. That is a part I'm especially skeptical of. You know, I could see them p potentially doing, you know, this EV truck, but having that autonomy is tough even for Tesla and other, you know, very well-financed uh, companies. So we'll have to see on that claim. Um, but anyway, Rivian also, it, it's interesting with the pricing, which seems a little too good to be true to me personally. Um, they're saying it's going to be three different battery packs for different price points. Uh, they claim the cheapest one will be about $70,000 and have a 230-mile range and a 5 seconds zero to six which is still very impressive and um but that's still and there's gonna be a mid-level one for around 80 that's somewhere in the middle and then the fastest that big battery one this truck that will keep up with hyper cars and have over 400 miles of range supposedly is only gonna be only gonna be 90 grand which i really find hard to believe considering tesla charges over a hundred thousand dollars already for just a hundred kilowatt hour battery this is 180 so you get almost double the battery pack almost double the range and insane performance, and you're saying it's only going to be 90 grand? I there's no way. Honestly, I'd be surprised if it was under 150. Uh, whenever you know it actually comes out, if it does. Um, anyway, they're claiming, by the way, as far as that launch, they're saying it's going to be available fall of 2020, and you can put down a thousand dollar deposit right now if you'd like. Um, so again. It sounds very promising. Sounds amazing. We'll see, you know, if they can actually make it to, you know, production where they would sell them, how they would sell them, all that type of stuff. They also showed an SUV version that's basically the same, but adds a third row instead of that truck bed, and also shortens the length by about 15 inches um, for both the overall length and the wheelbase. Um, and of course, that'll sell for everyone who doesn't want a truck, wants you know the extra seating uh, capability, and you still get all that insane performance and range. So all sounds good. We'll have to wait and see. Um, Cadillac revealed uh, the 2019 Sport Edition for the Escalade at the LA Auto Show, which basically just blacks out all the trim and the wheels for 2700 bucks, And that's basically all that GM had. Um, and uh, mostly because the biggest GM news this week was about the stuff they're killing off. Um, and uh, I'm going to briefly go over this uh, and just highlight the models they killed off. There was a bunch of uh, political stuff and corporate uh, turmoil that was, uh, you know, spun because of all this stuff. So there's all kinds of uh, crazy stuff going on around this story. I'm not going to get into all that. I'm just going to highlight the car stuff here and that's it. Um, but they're going to be closing. The, the reason why they're killing these six cars, by the way, is because they're closing three of the plants and all the vehicles built at those plants. Uh, they're killing off as well. Instead of relocating those cars to other plants, they're just killing them off. I guess it was kind of convenient as far as the models that uh, were at risk here anyway. So the plants they're closing, there's one in Ohio, one in Michigan, and one in Ontario, Canada. Um, but anyway, the six vehicles. The first one is the Chevy Volt, which is actually the most surprising one for them to kill off. Um, and um, I think, you know, since GM's going towards electrification, it's only a matter of time before a new Volt comes. Um, it'll obviously just, this one was a few years old at this point, so I could see them just kind of killing it off. There'll be a new version built somewhere else eventually, and maybe they can relocate some of those jobs uh, to this new Volt whenever they do decide to do something, because I'm almost certain they, they will. I mean, they still have the Bolt, which is completely EV. Um, but I still think they, there's a place for a plug-in 
plug-in hybrid, of course, since everyone else is rushing to just start with plug-in hybrids. Um, another surprise, though, was the Cadillac CT6, which Cadillac had actually denied multiple times they weren't killing, and then they ended up killing it. Um, so it was just redesigned, too, which makes it even more surprising. And there was that new V-Sport version that I showed, um, again, uh, I believe, at the New York Auto Show or the Detroit Auto Show. One or the other had that debut, um, and it hasn't been out at all this year. I guess there's a little bit of a delay, um, but it's, you know, it's had that awesome twin turbo V8 that was exclusive to Cadillac. It was all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and so Jalopnik reached out to Cadillac to be like, what's going on with the CT6? You know, is the performance version still coming? What's up with all this? And supposedly they confirmed that these are going to be built until March still, the CT6, and that is going to be the new one is going to be built. The refreshed version will be built until March. Um, and the last of those cars on the production line will be the V Sport versions. So I'm not sure how many they're going to build uh, between now and March, but I can guarantee you um, that the limited production and, uh, you know, obviously the fact that this is the end of the CT6 line completely means these things are going to be expensive and rare. Um, so uh, run down to your Cadillac dealer now if you want a V-Sport version of the CT6 because they're going to be, I'm sure, very sought after. Um but Cadillac did reassure people that at the current sales rates, um, there will be enough CT6s produced, uh, you know, th up until March that that will actually last for dealer inventory for the entire uh, length of 2019, supposedly. So we'll have to see about that. But um, so they're saying, you know, it's really not, you, you have another year or so to buy a CT6 if you want one. Um, they're also killing off the XTS, uh, which honestly uh, was kind of redundant anyway with the CTS, which is also getting killed. Uh, that was already announced and the CT6, but the XTS is also getting killed off too. Um, so, uh, you know, that again, that made sense since the XTS was a little redundant. It didn't sell super great either. Um, and we do know that there's going to be a Cadillac CT5 and CT4 coming, you know, a midsize thing. Thing to kind of stand in the place of the CTS and the ATS of the CT4, um, but no large sedan from Cadillac, which is kind of crazy. Obviously, everyone's obsessed with SUVs these days, and that's the direction they're going, but still, it's kind of a bummer. The CT6 was a nice halo model, and even if you know it didn't sell a lot, I think it really fit the Cadillac um, mentality, and uh, so that's kind of a bummer. Um, but anyway, like I said, the CT4 and CT5 sedans will be coming next year, so there will still be Cadillac sedans available, don't worry. Um, one uh, that's not surprising as well here is the Chevy Impala, which is getting killed off. And honestly, I'm saying finally killed off, because it's been, um, you know, really outdated for a long time now, and uh, still sold decently, though, amazingly. Um, and anyway, uh, you know, the Malibu is already pretty close to the same size as the Impala, since the Malibu has blown up over the past few years. And so, uh, you know, that's, I think, again, a redundant model for the Impala and makes sense to just go for the newer Malibu. Um, and the Malibu is living on. I, there's a few places saying that GM's killing all their sedans. That is not true at all. The Malibu is still going to be around in several other sedans as well. Um, the Spark and the Sonic are also around still for the time being, um, since those are built in Korea and that's a totally separate thing. Um, but they might die off soon too, because I'm sure the sales aren't great for those. But the cruise is uh, getting killed off. That is one they did confirm. Um, and that means there are now no compact American small sedans to buy. Uh, Dodge, of course, killed off the Dart years ago. And Ford is getting rid of the Focus here in the States. So um, there is, if you want an American small car, you can't get one. I mean, obviously, there's some that are built here in America. I think the Super Impreza and a few others, you know, but nothing from an actual American brand, which is, again, really, really crazy. Um just different times we're going towards here. Lastly, Buick is killing off the LaCrosse, uh, which again isn't a huge surprise, but I actually reviewed one uh, about, a, I think, about two years ago now, and I actually thought it was pretty nice. If you want just a large, comfortable cruiser, you know, some people would just want a sofa on wheels, and it did a very good job at doing that and still drove pretty nicely as well. So uh, a little bit of a bummer there, but I don't think too many people are going to miss it. And Buick is still offering the Regal as well. So if you want a sedan from Buick, you can still get that. Um, and also the Cascade. Of, I would thought they would announce the discontinuation of that since the Opal version is getting killed off that the uh, Buick version is based on, but they didn't announce that yet. I guess they want to kind of soften the blow and that'll come later, but that's produced overseas anyway, so it doesn't really hurt any American jobs or anything. Um, but yeah, so that's all the vehicles that GM is killing off here. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's unfortunate, but you know, I think some of these, it was long overdue. And for others, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's kind of a shame, but you know, GM is coming out with new stuff. They did reiterate that, that there are going to be new models that will be built in new places and stuff. So 
hopefully it's not all bad news, especially for the workers. You know, it's a, really a bummer for them. Um, but anyway, hopefully this helps lead to a stronger GM that, you know, can put out, you know, some impressive stuff in the future. And the last debut from LA here was Fiat has revealed the uh, refreshed uh, 2019 version of the 500X. And so it now gets standard all wheel drive, which is a nice inclusion. And it also now gets a standard 1.3 liter turbocharged four cylinder engine, tiny little motor. Um, does 177 horsepower though, and 210 pound feet of torque here in the American version, which is really a powerhouse for a tiny little engine. Um, it's also the only engine available now. There used to be a couple choices, not anymore. You used to also be able to get a manual a few years ago, that's gone away as well. There's only a nine speed automatic available here for the 500X now. Uh, the looks have only slightly changed. You get these darker and sharper headlights and taillights. Um, inside, it gets some nice changes though, including a new gauge cluster that I really like. It looks to be inspired by Alfa Romeo's, uh, which is pretty cool. There's also some new seat fabrics and a new steering wheel. It also now comes standard with uh, a seven inch touchscreen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which is a nice inclusion. And it's gonna be starting at $25,785 and goes on sale in the spring. Spring. The last news story of this week is uh, a rumor about a new Ferrari and a new one-off Ferrari that actually did come out. First is a rumor here that uh, comes from a respected source on the Ferrari chat forums uh, who claims that convertible version of the A12 Superfast is coming um, and it'll supposedly be called the A12 S Spider. And um, he says it'll have a folding roof similar to the Portofino's. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if this is gonna be some type of, again, hyper limited thing or if this is a normal production model. I really hope it's just a normal production uh, vehicle because um, you know the idea of that screaming V12 with no roof is just glorious. And it's really never been offered aside from like very limited stuff like the LaFerrari Aperta had that V12 um, with no roof. And, you know, there's like a few of those like F12 America, I think, and a few other uh, very, very limited things where they made like five or 10 cars and that's it. But it'd be awesome to have a mass produced, you know, mass in Ferrari standards, uh, you know, V12 convertible. That would be phenomenal and would go immediately on my dream car list <laughs> and so um yeah we'll have to see if that turns out to be true or not um but speaking of rare exceptions and stuff there's a new one-off called the ferrari sp3jc um which uh is a thing that was com commissioned by a very wealthy guy that i think owns a ferrari dealer and he took an f12 tdf and gave it a, this unique body this is a ferrari thing ferrari did for him um but he kind of specified what they did they took the f12 tdf gave it a unique body um it has a12 super fast taillights and wheels and then of course made it a convertible there and i think it's really good it harkens back of course to some of the um racing roadsters from the uh, 50s and 60s and um Anyway, it's one of one just for this guy, and that's it. Um, but like I said, hopefully more open-air V12s are on the way. That would be phenomenal, and I would uh, continue to buy lottery tickets to hopefully get one. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, exciting to hear, and fingers crossed that comes soon. That would be awesome. But yeah, so that's it for all the news this week, guys. Thank you guys very much for those of you who stuck till the end here. Uh, I really appreciate your support as always. Thank you guys very much for watching. I'll see you guys next week. Take care.